For me, makeup is less about like hiding my face or putting a mask and more about revealing something that's inside. I was a boy putting on makeup at the time when boys wearing makeup 20 years ago still wasn't a thing. I did know that doing that and getting on the subway and going to the club, the whole journey towards the club might be an issue. I felt terrified, right? Because in some countries and cities, it's even like punishable by death. We are all complex and we are all many different people inside. But this is a part of me that I've never had an opportunity to explore. The way that we present as queer people is a way of pushing back, and makeup could be a huge part of that. Are you ready for your reveal? Yeah. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! Oh, my God! yourself to me and share a little bit about yourself. My name is Bilal, my pronouns are he, they. My name is Haley Robinson. I am a Cree Filipino two-spirit being. My pronouns are all pronouns, but I definitely prefer they, them. Well, my name is Steva. That's a combination of Steve and Diva, so Canada, you're welcome for that. I'm 48 years old and my pronouns are he, him. My name is Gabriel, and my pronouns are he, him. But while I'm in drag, my pronouns are she, her. My name is Tony. My pronouns are she, her. I'm an indigenous woman. I'm a lesbian. So my name is Sarah. I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as a lesbian. My name is Lene Ramirez. I go by they, them. My name is Gladys, and my pronouns are she, they. My name is Jerry, she, her. I am a multidisciplinary artist slash fucking thing. I don't really feel the need to identify as anything. Thing. From any moment, I can I could change. Where I'm from is a bit of a complicated question. My parents are Pakistani. I was uh, born in Saudi Arabia. I grew up my whole life in Dubai. When I was 17, I moved to Canada. I'm Brazilian-Canadian. I'm a digital artist in a video game company. I also do drag as a hobby. See, I just have YouTube and gay audacity, and that's all I have. I am a part-time barista, part-time actor, and part-time TikTok creator. I teach group fitness classes. Oh, work. Before that, I had a whole corporate world, and I found fitness 13 years ago, and I was like, let me try this thing. I've become a star in fitness. I love it. At least in my own head. I I am currently finishing up a PhD in clinical psychology. I'm an artist and writer, and I like to work with video and sound. I grew up in Hong Kong, and then I moved to Canada when I was in middle school. In terms of my artistic practice, I, I'd say I'm a writer first and foremost. It's what comes the most naturally to me, but um, I really love fashion, so I make clothes as well. I'm a mom. I work with a crisis team. I've been a social worker, oh God, since 1997. So however many years that is, I don't want to count them. It's something that's really important to me. The idea of being a healer is part of being two-spirited to me. Two-spirited people were the medicine people, they were the healers, the counselors, because they were thought to see both sides, because we carry the male and the female spirit within us. I'm a painter, I'm artist overall. I'm also in the ballroom scene and I walk face, I walk realness, butch realness. I walk body as well. Okay, body, body, body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you share your journey of self-discovering your queerness and what it was like coming out? I think my queerness has just always been there since I was a kid. It took me a lot of time to accept it. The boys would like talk about having crushes on girls and I was like, oh yeah, like I don't really know if I really feel that way. I was like, noticing getting these weird butterfly feelings around a lot of like girls at school, but I, I didn't understand it because I didn't watch any queer movies. There wasn't anybody that was talking about being queer or anything like that. And it wasn't until high school I fully came out as bi or pansexual. Yeah, I didn't really have any like real interactions, like queer interactions up until like university, I would say, but I had these like little crushes on like friends or like, you know, things that you didn't really acknowledge. I remember being 16 and being in this little restaurant and um, somebody telling me that the bartender was a lesbian. Oh my God, the bartender was a lesbian. And she had a bed in the back room and if she liked you, you got to go in the back room. And so I remember trying to flirt with her because God damn it, I wanted to go in that back room. A totally different generation. How do you 
tell people that you're interested in women. I had these feelings, but I didn't know what to do with them. So I just went on with life, met a man, got married, had children. I was married to a man for about eight years. Mm -hmm. So I was very straight, white picket fence, Catholic family. I was married to a police officer. Like I had a very, like I guess, traditional uh, heteronormative life. I started thinking about and questioning my sexuality sort of just before the pandemic started. I would just daydream about being able to be with a woman. So it took me a long time to come out because it just wasn't acceptable. I, at 19, you got married, you had children. That was, that was a woman's life. Ultimately, I did decide to leave him. <sighs> R.I.P. I will say that he is a wonderful man and was very supportive and I was very lucky and privileged in that way. Yeah, he wasn't too thrilled. Maybe he's got a new wife. He's fine. I'm now engaged to a uh, my life partner. I think she's my soulmate. I definitely spent a lot of time uh, not realizing my identity and now looking back and seeing some of the ways that I was, the ways that I thought about myself and some of my struggles growing up, I think it kind of all these little like rainbow flags of queerness, but not realizing it until I was much older. And then it wasn't until very recently too, when I started reconnecting with my culture, my Cree side, I just wanted to reach out more to my bio parents and get to know them more because it was just always this feeling of like something was missing in my life. Again, because I grew up in Alberta, I grew up with a white family. It was mostly a lot of white people around me. I always felt so like disconnected and like not belonging in a way. And I just wanted to find a community and find a family, essentially. I started learning and finding out about two spirit beings and it just like really clicked with me and it made so much sense about how I was growing up. It's essentially like, I am both male, female, I'm not just one, I embody all of those. It's a very cultural, spiritual, ceremonial practice and way of being in indigenous cultures. You know, people think of Brazil about like as like a very liberal place. You have like carnival and you know, half naked people all the time. Yeah. But it's not that liberal if you're queer. I would be afraid to do drag in Brazil. Unfortunately, Brazil is a, one of the countries that has more violence towards queer people in the world. The whole time while I was living in Dubai, like I was like, there's no way I'm coming out to my family because worst case scenario, if they were to freak out and they were to disown me or something like that, I can't go anywhere. I can't, there are no resources for me to legally go to and be like, I'm queer, I, I need help. They're either gonna imprison me or you know, like I would face violence of some sort. So I didn't feel safe coming out to them while I was still living in Dubai. Because I grew up in Hong Kong, being straight is like the standard. They don't teach their children about that and they don't talk about that at school. And like there's like some kind of stigma in society that people won't be talking about it or if they talk about it, they would just like treat it as like a kind of a joke. It's still illegal to be gay in Nigeria. If they find you, they arrest you and they beat you. You could die because of it. And my family kind of let, let on early that it wasn't okay to be gay because of the things they would say and how they would say it. <laughs> they said really horrible things and you know I never wanted to feel the way I felt when they said those things about other people. I feel like if they said it to me it would just completely break our relationship so we just kind of keep those things separate. It's kind of unfortunate, but you know, that's the way it, it has to be. I have a younger brother. He's he's two years younger than me. In Dubai, like in my high school, a lot of a lot of people knew that I was queer. And my brother, unfortunately, was the younger brother of the gay kid, right? So even though I faced a lot of like bullying or harassment for being queer, uh, he also got like a lot of it as well for being my younger brother. So for him, I think it harbored, harbored a lot of like resentment towards me. When I came to Canada and I was just kind of, you know, exploring my sexuality, I decided to go to Pride in 2019 because, hello, like I've, I've, I've never been to Pride my whole life and, and it's like the gayest thing that you can do, you know, like it's the, it's the experience of a lifetime. And I was like, I have to go, I have to. I took pictures and I decided to post it on my Instagram because I was like, you know what, like fuck it. Like I'm in Canada, like no one can do shit to me. Like I'm literally considered a protected person in this country. And my brother then, he outed me to my mom. It was a really sad experience for me. So my mom ended up kicking me out after a few months. And I think she was under the impression that if she just cuts me off financially and emotionally, like I will just come back running to her and I'll just turn back into a straight person. I was like, there's there's no way. I've known this my whole life. It, this was four years ago, right? And also like PS, 
now my mom and I are totally fine. Like we're homies, we're chill. I literally live with her now. She has a lot more questions and I'm able to answer them a lot more comfortably because so much time has passed. There was always this expectation that like, okay, like you're gay, but don't be like one of those gays. You don't have to present feminine in any way. And I was terrified of anything feminine about me. I feel like inside of the gay community, the the gay men uh, presenting as uh, feminine mm -hmm. is something seen as like unattractive. Mm -hmm. Even though after I was in Canada and I was with my partner, I was afraid that he would find me unattractive mm -hmm. and he would not love me anymore. And I say like, oh, thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for loving me. And he said, it's so easy. It's so easy. And I never thought about being easy to love me. And that's what I needed to learn, to love myself first and not look for it outside. I haven't talked to my family, but I've talked to some teachers and professors, especially those who identify as being queer. And I ask them for their advice and sometimes I chat with them about my experiences. And that helps me a lot into understanding myself more. I have actually never come out. <laughs> like I never really came out to my friends or my family. Everyone just kind of knew something was up with me. I think queer is like the perfect word to describe me. Have I come up to my parents? No. Do I feel I need to at this point in my life? No. Do I think they know I'm gay? Yes. I think they do know I'm gay, but I don't feel like I need to say the words anymore at this point of my life. I don't think I need to say those words to anybody in this point of my life. As I walk through the world, if you want to be in my life, you'll find out I'm gay along the way. You'll find out I'm queer along the way based on hanging out with me and the things I like to do and things I'm interested in and the things I stand up for. Can you tell me about your relationship to makeup? I love makeup. Way back when, they had this thing called World Beauty Kits and you could get them for one dollar. But one day I stayed home from school and I was playing with the makeup. And I probably had blue eyeshadow up to here and lovely pink cheeks and there was a knock at the door. Well, back then, if you didn't show up for school, they had something called a truant officer who would show up at your door. Well, he sat me down and told me that I was gonna be working the streets by the time I was 18. That was what makeup was back then. Like, that was the idea. If you were wearing makeup, a lot of it, then you must be a sex worker. And that was not the word they used. What he told me made me go, oh, there's no fucking expectations for me in life. And coincidentally, by 19, I was doing some sex work. During my rebellious era, <laughs> I saw characters who were painted to be stereotypical women. I did not like them. I was like, oh, this is like setting back womanhood a million years. But then like the older I get, the more I see the nuances in those characters. And they're not just pretty little helpless things, you know? They're strong women who have to go through this world being women and that takes a lot. Sometimes you just want to put on your mini skirt and feel your little glitter fantasy and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm trying to explore a lot of new makeup looks just cause I'm gonna say I was very whitewashed and I tried to look exactly like everybody else in my school. My relationship to makeup is a really complicated story. At the age of 25, I started losing my hair to the point where I had, I've lost my eyebrows and my eyelashes as well. In a way of trying to sort of hide that I had lost my hair, I tried to like paint on eyebrows and wear fake eyelashes, I wore wigs. It was actually a very painful thing having to put on makeup every day. It was really uncomfortable. It felt like I was hiding who I was. And at that same time, I was also training to become a therapist and in the ways that I was trying to teach my clients how to be true to themselves, I felt like I was doing the opposite and I was like living this double life. It was hard because honestly, a lot of people in Alberta, they knew me. And then when I started coming into who I actually was, they were like, why are you trying to dress like this? Why are you trying to look like this? Like you're trying to change who you are. And I, I just had to keep explaining like, no, like this is who, I really am, like this is who I was the whole time. I was just trying to conform to westernized, colonized society here in Alberta. So I went through the process of coming out as bald. I know it's a funny thing to think about, but like I had to come out to people who didn't know that that was something that had happened. It was really liberating for me. I finally feel so free and like, comfortable. I'm just like, I'm really excited to continue on this journey because I'm just starting, honestly. <laughs> now being able to sort of be out, I would love to be able to reconnect with this like really artistic way of expressing yourself. And I would love to be able to figure out how to use that and, and wear that without feeling like I'm hiding something. When I first started realizing that I was queer, I couldn't really dabble around with makeup because, you know, growing up in a Muslim country, I couldn't walk into a Sephora as, as a teenage boy 
and pick out a random foundation because people would be like, what are you doing? I always wanted to change like my hairstyle and like dye my hair and also do some makeup to be like, ah, cool. <laughs> I can't really do that in front of my parents. The way that they think would still impact me even when I'm not living with them, which I think is kind of sad actually. So I really didn't have the opportunity or chance to dabble with makeup until I started entering my mid to late teens because that's the age when like my girlfriend started getting really into makeup and when we would be like you know hanging out in their rooms they'd be like Bilal like do you want us to do your makeup my initial reaction to it was honestly like I was I feel I felt terrified right because it's something that's illegal it's something that you can get imprisoned for in some countries and cities it's even like punishable by death and thankfully like they were all super super supportive and they're like Bilal like no one's gonna take any pictures at all like if you want to take pictures of yourself and look at them later you know you're more than more than welcome to do that but we're not gonna take any pictures we're not gonna tell anyone and yeah. that's kind of like where it started and then once I came to Canada it just it, it was something that happened more and more frequently as well. As a child I never played with makeup and I'm in Brazil there wasn't really a drag scene. It was in Canada that I started seeing more of that. I kind of realized after diving into my masculine side that I felt a lot more comfortable in that. And with makeup, it does somewhat become a performance once that's activated. In a way, I feel like a drag queen. Like I feel as though I am a boy in drag. If I really want to like feel like that character, I'm gonna like get completely glammed up. And I remember being very uncomfortable by drag. And I think that's the beauty of it. It's about taking people out of their comfort zone. It's about bringing out something that um, it's inside of you and showing it to the world. For me, makeup is less about like hiding my face or putting a mask and more about revealing something that's inside. It lets me get that femininity that I was so scared of for so long and turn it up to a thousand. And that's why it's so healing. I started playing with makeup in my early 20s. I never felt it was a weird thing or this grand gesture I was doing, even though I was a boy putting on makeup at the time when boys wearing makeup 20 years ago still wasn't a thing. So I didn't think I was being progressive. I was just doing whatever I felt in my body. That's always how I've walked through the world, just do what I feel. I did know that doing that and getting on the subway and going to the club, the whole journey towards the club might be an issue, whatever, right? So I had to be vigilant. My comfort level comes with age and maturity. Like I literally give two fucks about what people think anymore, right? Do you want to stare at me, I'll help you take pictures about me, for me, with me. I like to do fun stuff and I like to do things that are different. And I know that people have these opinions, but they're not mine. We are all complex and we are all many different people inside. But this is a part of me that I've never had an opportunity to explore or to show. There wasn't a place to do it. It's hard to start getting out of your comfort zone, but just remembering that it all comes off. Encourage yourself to mess up. Yeah, I like that. How do the intersections of your identity impact how you express your queerness? I feel like I have a lot of identities. It's been kind of hard to pick which one to put on the forefront at any moment in time. No matter what I present as or like how I look, I'm all the parts of me all at once, you know? Even if I wanted to hide it, they all come out. Like, I'm a black woman, <laughs> I'm a queer woman. And I think both those things are very, very cool. Even with all the bullshit about being Nigerian, I love being Nigerian. I just felt like my two worlds never intersected. My parents have a Caribbean descent. They're immigrants from Trinidad, which is heavily influenced by religious dogma. So when I was coming out, I felt Catholic guilt or Christian guilt or whatever, insert religion guilt here. And that was problematic for me. And I think that distanced my brownness from my queerness because my brownness was so wrapped up into my culture, my Trinidadian culture. You know, like initially there was a lot of turmoil for me, like just trying to figure out a way to make all of them work because more specifically, like being a Muslim person and being a queer person, generally speaking, are, are looked upon as a paradox, right? It's like you can't be Muslim and be queer at the same time because, oh wait, like don't you go to hell? Isn't it against your, your religion as a Muslim to be queer? And at the same time, being in queer communities and introducing myself as a Muslim, I, I faced like a lot of, I don't want to say discrimination for it, but they were definitely weirded out by it, that this person is a Muslim, but he's queer as well. I think one thing I'm aware of is, you know, I have a lot of privilege. Being able to have that privilege has made my journey a lot more soft and forgiving than perhaps others. When I think about sort of the like delays in coming out, I attribute a lot of it to religion. My mom was very involved in the Catholic Church. You can't deny the impact that a lifetime of like, you know, the church telling you that you're gonna go to hell if you are gay 
what that would have on a child mm -hmm. and even an adult. I never had an example of gay or lesbian people in my life. I remember coming out and my mom being like, why didn't you tell us? I would have never rejected you. I love you mm -hmm. so much. She was a great mom, but the like absence of of knowledge almost had as much of a damaging impact as having you know her say those damaging things as well. It wasn't because I was hiding it. I didn't feel like I so much had to come out of the closet as I had to realize there was a closet in the first place. Eventually I got there and it, it took a lot of research. It, it took a lot of self-reflection as well. I have a very strong spiritual connection with God, right? With Allah, like Islam is something that's very, very important to me. It's not something that I'm ever willing to let go. My identity as, as a queer person is also something that I'm not willing to let go, right? It is who I am and it's it's something that I fought so hard to be. I started feeling an even stronger and, and closer connection to, to Allah, right? And it was very validating for me because it was like, wow, like I feel a stronger connection to to, to God. And at the same time, I, I, I feel, more queer than I ever have before as well. But I literally became the holiest person and I'm like, this is who I am. It was one of my early prides in Toronto and it was like pouring rain, it was this hot sun. Blocker Room was playing Soka music and Soka's Trinidad music. And it was the best experience being around other people of color, queer people of color. And those two worlds just came together, my Trinidadian culture and my queer culture. And that's when I became a full person. I never really thought about that until I got this question. And it makes me feel so happy. Growing up uh, in an adopted white family that was also very Christian, I felt like I had to suppress a lot of my queerness. I didn't know a lot of queer people growing up. And so essentially I just conformed to the westernized society of being a straight person and also being really white Washed. Growing up black in a white city definitely affected my ability to just be myself. You know, that can go just to like being a black woman in general, because like black femininity is a whole different thing from white femininity. Like I didn't really have anybody to relate to, but like, you know, you actually go to school and nobody has a crush on you, or if they do, it's a secret thing. I just became more and more insecure about how I was perceived as a girl. I feel like I just, looked so different. You know, I had my cornrows. They were not blowing in the wind. Eventually, I'm like really seeking a bunch of male validation. And I think that just took over my identity for too long. I hate being considered as a strong black woman. I'm strong, I'm black, I'm a woman. But being a strong black woman is not a flex to me. I don't wanna have to be strong all the time. It's not like, an identity. Yeah, it's not, it's not an identity. And it's like, black women have been forced to be strong. It's not like, something that we've chosen to do. And so I just feel like by putting that on us, it just like doesn't afford us like the same space to be soft. And I'm a very soft girl. I feel like, especially after I accepted being queer and kind of was moving away from like male validation, interacting with women like romantically and looking masculine, I just realized like, oh, like, this is who I would have been if I didn't care, literally as a child. I kind of wish I had been doing this for longer, but Same. you know, divine timing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until like I found a bunch of indigenous two-spirit beings that I like found a community and I started becoming more open with my queerness and who I was. It wasn't for them like, fuck, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> I think in some ways I've been very lucky to be the rebel that I am because it didn't matter whether it was as an indigenous woman, it didn't matter like whether it was colonialism, it didn't matter who it was. If you were trying to push something on me, I was like, fuck you. I've just always fought back against anybody telling me that I can't be who I am. By my, my sexuality as a, as a gay male, my expression of queerness is as like having a bit of a femininity, a bit of a fluidity, to me, it was always something I was scared of. I had to work through this like self-hate almost. Like I had an urge to belong. I had an urge to blend in. I had an urge to pass. And at one point I just thought like, you know what? For us to have all this privilege, for us to have all this space, the people that are in the front lines of that are the people that cannot hide their queerness. For me to have these privilege, for me to feel a little bit safe, it was on the backs of those people and how I need to support them and I needed to, to be a better ally and I needed to use my voice. I can't be anything but authentic to myself and anybody in my life. Like, if you're not speaking up, you're part of the problem. 
you are just quietly benefiting from oppression. You can't just not be racist. You have to be anti-racism. You have to be anti-homophobia -homoph and you need to do something about it. What message would you like to share in a time where we are experiencing a heightened level of harassment and criminalization for using tools like makeup? People in power are so afraid that marginalized communities have surged to gain some type of power and rights and they, they're so afraid of losing their power or, or there's a, being a power shift. The thing is when other people get power, it doesn't take power away from people who are in power. When you lift someone up, you're not losing out, you're just lifting them up. I think the population is the most queer it's ever been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're also experiencing this resurgence of political and policy violence against the queer community. When someone doesn't understand something, it's very difficult for them to start taking the perspective of people who are in that community that they're not in. What I hope in this situation is that they can listen more, can listen to what queer people have to say about themselves, and to actively be open to educate themselves to like learning in new information that are different from their existing way of understanding. We might not have been okay with being queer in my generation, but I feel like we fought so fucking hard for people to have the freedom to dress the way they want to dress, to be who they want to be, and, and to see this being turned around. How do we make so much progress? And then just go, oh, fuck that noise. We can't take our rights for granted. And don't wait for things to to reach you to do something about it because it could be too late. Never let anyone silence your voice or think they have the power to silence your voice because no one has that power. We have a lot of freedoms here in the Western world, but other areas in the world, they just don't. So that's why we have to stay vigilant for the, those people to fight for them. And so people don't roll back rights that we've attained at this point. The way that we present as queer people, if safe to do so, is a way of pushing back and fighting back. And makeup is, I think, could be a huge part of that. What advice would you have for someone wanting to be a better ally? Have genuine interest in whoever you're supporting. Don't be afraid of the things that you don't know. Ask questions, be curious. Try to understand what people are going through. Listen more than you talk. Stop being so afraid. We are literally just human beings as well. Sometimes they they treat us like they don't know how to talk with us. You don't have to like overthink everything. You just gotta respect me, I'll respect you. Goes both ways. We are all different people and we all have different needs. Just ask people. Some people like me, I don't need nothing from you except for to just accept me for who I am. Some people need more support. Some people need you to hold their hand and and go with them to their first queer bar. Try to understand that like they're still the same person, like nothing really changed. You need to make space and open doors, but do it in service rather than in saviorship. Do your research. Understand what kinds of discrimination and oppression that they're facing before you reach out to them and try to talk to them about it. It's so important for queer people to feel like they're speaking to someone who has at least tried to educate themselves. So as a straight ally, Using the privilege that you have to simply say something is one of the first things that you can do. Going to drag brunches, going to drag shows, sure, you're consuming our content, but that's not enough. You're not an ally unless you're speaking up. What advice would you give to a younger you? I always say, have more sex. <laughs> I swear to God, just, I, I think if it was gonna be really serious, like yes, have more sex, but also stop being so damned afraid. You don't need to please everyone. You just gotta be you. Sometimes I find it difficult to talk about like my true thoughts when people are talking about like issues that I'm concerned about. My ideal self would be to be able to speak up to whatever I think about and like not just to say what like I think other people want me to say. I always say that everybody has opinions just like everybody has an asshole. So that doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's a good opinion and it doesn't mean it's a good asshole. So know that it's okay to not connect with everybody. You know, a lot of people are actually very inspired by people who are different and they're just like, they won't say it. Have fun, dress how you wanna dress and don't let the pressure of like acceptance change you because that will set you back a little bit. Don't be afraid of taking space. Mm -hmm. Don't let people shut you down, diminish your light. That's the most 
genuine and beautiful thing about you. So embrace that. There will be people that will love you. And you will learn how to love yourself. And that's the most authentic type of love that you can have. It's the one that comes from within. First of all, I would give him a huge hug and I would, I would just tell him to, to be patient, you know? You, I know it feels like the world is all like really collapsing into you right now and nothing's gonna work out and, and you don't know how you're gonna balance your life and live your life the way that you want to, but I promise you it is all gonna work out. You're gonna meet so many people who are gonna help you experience love and, 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 and safety in ways that you've, you couldn't even imagine. Where you are in life is not all that there is to life. Just know that it's not forever. And sometimes like when you move past it, you'll be able to look back on it and just not necessarily appreciate it, but appreciate where you've come from. In my teenage years, I think I would tell myself to just be kinder and softer with yourself. I think in my 20s, I would tell myself to be brave. And then now that I'm in my 30s, I think I would tell myself that it gets so much better and it was worth it. Also the other thing probably is, don't sleep with all the men you met. <laughs> <laughs> Even if they're out of car, we're gonna drive you home. <laughs> what is the best part about being you? <laughs> oh shit! There's a lot of good things. I love being me. <laughs> Not to be like everything, but kind of everything. That's the one thing I love most about myself is my unapologeticness. <laughs> I love that I can be like one way today and another way tomorrow and still look feel, be amazing. I'm actually happy. I have this freedom today that I've never had before in my life. I'm so grateful to have a body that's pretty much healthy. Yeah, shit hurts, but it's manageable. I thought 63 meant a little walker, I'm like infirm, and that didn't happen. And I have all these freedoms to express myself, to come here, to do this. Oh, there's all these great things coming, and it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be whoever you want to be, no matter your age. <laughs> now that I'm playing with all the colors in the crayon box, it's so fun. Like, I feel like there's no limit, and that is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Not to brag here, but I think it's definitely my ability to be able to connect with individuals from all different walks of life. I think the best part about being me is knowing that I have the ability to create change in the world. To be able to say whatever I want to say. I think I am trying to be the person that teenage me needed, and that's just gonna be my continued life journey. Are you ready for your reveal? Yeah. Oh, shit! Damn, I look so fine! I'd fuck me. <gasps> yes! <laughs> yes! Oh my god. I live. I live for this. Oh my god, so happy. <laughs> That's me? Yes, you, babe! I'm fierce as fuck! Oh my gosh, it's so pretty! I feel so beautiful. Shit! Oh, it's absolutely friggin' amazing. You made me me. Oh, this is me. Oh, it's giving Megan like. <laughs> oh my god, I'm feeling the fantasy. Y'all, this is what it's like to be queer and brown and owning yourself. I'm serving everything. I actually can't see what I'm doing glasses. <laughs> Now it's time to get your photos taken by the Daniel Nostra. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hi, baby. Hi. Make sure you take care of the nail, okay? I'm gonna give you editorial puss, okay? okay? Magazine boots. We're okay. gonna give you everything, okay? To be good? Okay, let's go.
They will insult you, hurt you, defeat you, betray you, injure you, set you aflame and watch you burn, but they will not, shall not, cannot destroy you because you like Rome were built on ashes and you like a phoenix know how to rise and resurrect. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much you guys.